Often the debate can be had regarding whether or not the audience cares about the victims in a horror film or the killer themselves. And it can be even more polarizing when it comes to slashers. Sure, we all love the Laurie Strodes and Nancy Thompsons of the world, but what about this guy? Or this girl? In those instances, we are firmly on the side of the killer. So in 2003, when two titans of the horror genre did battle, you can sure as hell bet that there was no one buying a ticket to root on Miss Lori Campbell. I'm Tyler Nichols with Joe Blow Horror, and today on Real Slashers, we're taking a look at Freddy vs. Jason. been away from my children for far too long. I'm going to state right from the jump that this is infinitely more of an Elm Street film than a Friday the 13th film. The aesthetics align more with Elm Street and Freddy is quite literally using Jason as a way to spread his name. As he often is, Freddy is the puppet master in this situation, so it makes sense for the story to feel more on the nightmare side of things. But I do feel like it needs to be mentioned because I think it's a fair criticism from Friday fans wanting equal representation. It's time to put this bad dog to sleep. For good! The story of Freddy vs. Jason is actually pretty fun, with Freddy using Jason to start murdering kids on Elm Street. See, the town of Springwood has done its best to erase the Kruger name, and therefore cut off Freddy's supply of victims. But Jason doesn't like being controlled, and the two eventually square off in a bloody battle. This was one of the most popular horror films of the 2000s, so I'm not going to bore you by slowly moving through the plot. Let's focus on the slasheriness and the Jason and Freddy of it all. As a slasher, Freddy vs. Jason delivers the goods in terms of kills. While I'd argue that there are only a couple that stand out, the ones that do leave a pretty decent impression. Unfortunately, while the film does have a large body count, a lot of that comes from the corn maze scene, which is mostly just Jason slashing characters that we don't even know. One element that I always love about a Friday the 13th is the quick succession of kills that happen as the film enters its third act. Everyone who's not a final boy or girl is dying one scene after another. They obviously couldn't do that here, and I think it's one of the many ways that it plays out more like a nightmare film. These characters are being traumatized and then killed, and then there's always some kind of immediate reaction to their death. And the deaths are pretty decently spaced out. Maybe the corn maze was their way of doing a Friday the 13th style scene, but even then, killing in front of a bunch of people isn't exactly Jason's style. He stalks until he can't stalk no mo. Just one of many instances of the filmmakers not fully understanding the Jason Voorhees character. And I just have to bring up something about this movie that has always bugged me. Kelly Rowland falls asleep as she waits for Lori to wake up. Freddy messes with her in the dream and does a fun little Got your nose! He then proceeds to pull off her nose, but then when she wakes in the real world, her nose is still there. How? Going back to even the first Elm Street film, anything that happens in the dream will then translate over into the real world. And don't even tell me, it's because he's not powerful enough yet. Because we already saw when Freddy tries to kill Blake that his lack of power translates to the dream as well. Since the blades dissipate upon contact, so this makes absolutely no sense. But I guess it's a cool visual. The final 20 minutes of Freddy vs. Jason is absolutely brilliant. Oh, sweet, dark meat. Okay, fine. It was 2003 and they made some dumb dialogue choices. But the action itself between the two killers is next level. The amount of blood that these two spill from each other would be comical if it weren't these two characters at the forefront. Just by virtue of these two having such high body counts themselves, anything less than an Olympic pool volume of blood just wouldn't have been enough. You'll notice I didn't really focus on any of the human characters, and that's because they all kind of suck. Lori's our final girl, and she hardly even feels worthy of the title, let alone being someone that bested two of the greatest killers of all time. But like I said in the beginning, we press play for Voorhees and Kruger, not Lori Campbell. You're the one that killed Trent! Oh, don't worry about my little errand, boy. The only thing to fear 
is fear himself. Both Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees get quite the introduction here. Freddy narrates a whole section that summarizes much of the Elm Street timeline, complete with his many deaths. Unfortunately, New Line didn't have the rights to the Paramount era of Friday the 13th, so they weren't able to do a sweet montage in the same vein. They instead opted to show a brand new kill of Jason's. This does a decent job at setting up both of the behemoths for those that haven't had a ton of experience with them. Jason is big and brutish and likes to kill people in the woods. And Freddy likes to mess with teens in their dreams before killing them. And he also has a tendency to get murdered by a cute girl. We get a side of both characters that we hadn't quite gotten to this point in either of their respective series. First, there's Freddy in his demon form. Clearly speaking to the viewer from hell. His makeup is different and there's a ferociousness to it. We get another look that's a little more intense later on in the film when Freddy's about to kill Gib and as he jumps out of the lake after Lori. Clearly, this is his pissed off mode. Then when we see Jason, we get to see the full reanimation with his lungs filling with air as Freddy's Pamela Voorhees yells commands at him. This immediately solidifies that Jason is motivated by misbehaving young adults. But a lot of his behavior in this film feels more like Michael Myers than Jason Voorhees, with him stalking the suburbs versus a camp. I don't have an issue with Ken Kurzinger's version of Jason, but I do wish that we were able to see Kane Hodder in the role. There's a meanness that just isn't present here. Sure, Jason is tall and imposing, but that's about it. I don't hate his look, though it's a shame that the hockey mask is missing the trademark chunk taken out of it. Yet another reason that this doesn't feel like my Jason. But oh well. Freddy, on the other hand, is utterly perfect. Robert England's final time as Freddy is absolutely scene-stealing. He has such a command of a room when he puts on that makeup that his absence from cinema over the past 20 plus years has been sorely missed. This is some of the best Freddy makeup out there as well, being a perfect blend of pretty much every iteration that we've seen before. A red and green sweater, burnt skin, a dirty fedora, and a razor glove. Absolute perfection. You are like a big super dog who can't stop eating! Even though your master said you've had enough! What better scene to slice up than Freddy and Jason meeting for the first time? Okay, technically Freddy and Jason meet at the very beginning of the film, but Freddy's in Pam drag, so I'm not counting it. Instead, their first true meeting is after Freddy injects Voorhees with a ton of tranquilizer. Ah, poor Freebird. The scene has a great red aura to it that firmly puts this in Freddy's world. I really appreciate the use of red for Freddy and the use of green for Jason, even if it gives it an unintentional Christmas vibe. Freddy has always been a jokester, so I appreciate that he is immediately fucking with Jason, even making him think that he cut off his arms. There's a bit of a Looney Tunes quality about how they fight each other. The entire scene is shot like some kind of Hong Kong action film, complete with speed ramps and following Jason's machete as it soars through the air. There's an energy and fantastical side present that helps to separate it from their big fight later on. Freddy playing pinball with Jason's body wouldn't have worked so well had they not utilized this extreme lighting. It does a good job of hiding some of the issues that would have been there with the CGI. The worst part about this scene, and hell, the entire movie, is the dumb inclusion of Jason being afraid of water. We've seen Jason in water throughout the Friday the 13th franchise, so it's incredibly stupid to suddenly put the stipulation on the character. Hell, he's in water later on, so clearly this isn't some deep set fear of his. Hell, Freddy's been tormenting him about his mother the whole movie. The answer of Jason's fear is right there. The loss of his mother and need for vengeance. There's even more that they don't seem to understand about the Jason character. Because they show him being bullied by other campers. Since when is that canon? Last I knew, Pamela Voorhees set it up pretty well in the first film. The counselors weren't paying attention and Jason drowned. Heck, you'd think that if Jason were bullied as a youth, he'd probably also kill kids that are around the same age. Yet, anytime Jason is given the opportunity, he doesn't. Just stupid writing. 
The scene ends with Jason hilariously wireworking his way out of the van and Freddy entering his demon form. Seriously, so much is happening here. I pulled that out of my dream. God, how is that possible? Anything is possible now. God, you just don't get it. Oh God, y'all two killers were not safe awake or asleep. Freddy vs. Jason released in the United States on August 15, 2003 and managed to bring in $36.4 million on its opening weekend. The film would end its worldwide run at over $116 million, making it the most successful film for either franchise to that point. While the Freddy vs. Jason Rotten Tomato score is absolutely ludicrous, I do quite enjoy their critics' consensus, as I feel it's right on the nose. Fans of the two horror franchises will enjoy this showdown, but for everyone else, it's the same old slice and dice. Sure, the film doesn't break any new ground and isn't likely to bring in any new fans, but what it does do is provide a satisfying clash of two horror titans. It's no easy task to bring these two worlds together, and writers Damian Shannon and Mark Swift do a great job of melding them. And I know that they hate the Jason hates water thing too, so maybe let's stop putting the blame on them. I promise you, most of the things that you don't like about this movie are because of this guy. But you know who's also responsible for a lot of the fun in this movie? Also this guy. Filmmaking is complicated. The climax being so open-ended was a brilliant decision as it allowed there to be debate amongst audiences. Jason may have risen out of the lake holding Freddy's head, but Freddy winked, showing that he's still alive. He could technically start the process all over again. So if you're a Jason fan, you'll likely think that Jason won. And if you're a Freddy fan, you'll likely think that Freddy won. And that's the fun of it. I personally have viewed it like I do most of these films that these characters are destined to do this forever. Though with there being 14 and 15 years respectively since we've seen these characters in the movie theater, I'm starting to wonder if we'll ever get these two back on screen together again. We of course got two different comic arcs that would also include Bruce Campbell's Ash Williams, but otherwise there hasn't ever been a proper follow-up. At this point, I'd say the door is closed on another entry, but... If producers are somehow able to build Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees back up to the heights that they were once at, we may see them pitted against each other again. And hey, a man can dream. Oh God!